This is the Animal One half of the world famous tag team, the Road Warriors. Welcome back to In Your Head Wrestling Radio. I'm the internet icon, the pride of the pilgrims, handsome Jackie Jones. And joining me is wrestler, former wrestler, manager, referee, booker, author, leader of the Four Horsemen, J.J. Dillon. It's a pleasure to have you here. Ah, the pleasure's all mine. Yeah. And oddly enough, I looked this up. It's almost 13 years to the day when you were on here. It was... um. May eighteenth, two thousand five, was the first time you were on the show. Wow, you got you keeping great records, or you have a good memory, or both. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a lot of time that's passed, and and I have uh, done a fair amount of interviews in between, and I uh, I have to admit I can't remember what I had for breakfast, so I sadly cannot remember details of the last time we talked in two thousand and five. So <laughs> hopefully we won't repeat ourselves. Right, right. I will, I will admit I cheated, and I looked it up on the website. But I should have just ran with the great memory, maybe. No, so, uh, good. yeah, coming up, uh, New England Fan Fest 6. Uh, you're going to be there Saturday, June 2nd, East Providence, Rhode Island. And you'll also be there the Friday night for the VIP dinner. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I believe that... The, um, Maybe mistaken, but I think Cranston is where the VIP dinner is taking place on uh, uh, on uh, Friday, and then Saturday um, from eleven to three, I will be signing at the New England Fan Fest number six, and it will be in East Providence, Rhode Island, at the Brotherhood of the Holy Ghost Charity Hall, and it's a chance to greet fans, sign autographs. Take photos, just uh, just having a, a good old time talking wrestling. So yeah. I'm there for everything from the VIP dinner on Friday to um, you know being there for the <clears throat> the, the fan fest itself, and then actually uh, on Saturday night there is also going to be uh, a new New England Hall of Fame uh, induction dinner, and they've got a surprise inductee for this year, and I'm. I'm going to be there at the dinner as well since uh, somebody leaked word to me as to who it is, and it's somebody that I want to be there to uh, share the moment. Oh, very cool. I'll be there as well. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people, they think of the J.J. Dillon character. They think of, you know, Carolinas. But you worked a lot in New England. So what is the the difference between uh, uh, working for a New England crowd as compared to, to other places in the country? I can't. I well to start with, I I did work some in New England, but I never worked what That's was called the Northeast Territory. I made okay. uh, spot appearances, <clears throat> and most of my career, oddly enough, I spent uh, either in the South, Mid South, or the South or Midwest. Uh, never really worked too much, except sporadic dates on the West Coast, and then <clears throat> I did spend a year in Australia wrestling and with two side trips to New Zealand going and coming and uh, made about seven trips uh, upwards of six weeks uh, wrestling in Japan and actually uh, in Europe too. I did uh, Bremen, one of the tournaments over there for for seven weeks uh, years back. So I, <laughs> I've been everywhere. I think I, in the, the States, because I kept a ledger at one time, I think I actually appeared in 44 of the States. I haven't hit them all and Never got to Mexico, most of Canada, uh, but not uh, not all of Canada. So I've, I've got a chance to get out there and meet wrestling fans from all corners of the world. Yeah. When you started wrestling, did you ever think it would take you all around the world? Uh, I didn't really think about it. I, I kind of had in my mind that to be able to kind of have like a a bucket list. Well, you know, my bucket list is I got to do this, this, and this. And that included being able to go to Australia, being able to go to Japan, because all of the so-called great talents and stars went there. So I thought, you know, before I can be satisfied that I'm anywhere near that level, if they invite me to go to Australia or Japan or and Japan. And then the last one was, uh, um, to actually wrestle in Madison Square Garden. I, I was born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey, and as a kid, I used to go up to uh, to the Garden, which to me is the mecca of professional wrestling. And 
especially from somebody from the from the Northeast, with uh, all the uh, title shots that Bruno San Martino had, uh, m- most of which I saw, and then I became a referee be- for about eight years, and which was mo- mas- mostly in the Eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey. I did go up to Boston, uh, but I refereed many of uh, Bruno's uh, title defenses against the Georgie Animal Steel and Killer Kowalski and uh, the Sheik and Jess Ortega and Gorilla Monsoon. and uh, I mean, they were great, great memories for me. And, of course, we recently lost Bruno Sammartino, which uh, was a very sad day to, to me because he was so kind to me when I was just a kid in college and he was on top of the world and uh, – he he showed me great kindness, which only reflected to me the kind of guy he was. So, uh, Davey O'Hannon and uh, and myself uh, with uh, you know, geez, I can't think of his name now. Who drove down from uh, Yonkers, New York, and the three of us uh, drove out to pay our, our final respects to Bruno. And um, it's just one of those painful trips you make, but. And, and it was a difficult week because Paul Jones had passed that week. Um, John L. Sullivan, who I, who was from Pittsburgh and been trained by Bruno and Dominic Danucci, and he and I started about the same time uh, in the late 70s, or uh, 1980, up to 1980, around Pittsburgh, and I, I wrestled him a lot. And he uh, crossed in the street near Bruno's house and was struck by a truck and, and uh died from his injury so it was a really really a tough week but bruno was uh you know one of those bigger than life characters that you and, and you know and i knew that he had some health issues and been in and out of the hospital but you just couldn't imagine uh, a world without the, the great bruno san martino now um what was it like to to be a referee in a match with bruno what was there a special uh aura around him well, it was definitely a special aura around him, and uh, the the job as a referee has always been a good referee is uh, to almost be invisible, not be seen. In other words, you're, people don't buy tickets to see the referee. So, I mean, you have certain times that you, you know, if you're enforcing the rules and, and you know, you got to be a little bit more assertive, but you're not there to interfere with the action. You're there to just do your job and and kind of try to restore law and order and let whatever happens we, between the the two individuals that the fans bought tickets to see go, uh, you know, have it take place. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was, um, he's definitely before my day, but uh, when I was watching wrestling in the '80s, uh, he did an angle where he came out of retirement to fight Macho Man because uh, Randy dropped the uh, the bell on on Ricky Steamboat. And uh, and so on the house shows, they uh, they did a, a couple matches. I don't know how many matches they did, but uh, I grew up in uh, Cape Cod, and on uh, Ness and New England Sports Network, they would show the Boston uh, uh, shows every month, and it was a big deal, especially my grandfather, you know, because uh, he watched Bruno, because uh, he comes out of retirement to, to wrestle uh, Macho Man. I still have it on VHS tape somewhere, but, you know, it's a, it was a huge deal. And even then, you know, older, uh, you could tell, like, there was something special about him. Yeah, it, uh, it Bruno had that, you know, in, in the wrestling profession, we call we refer to it as the it factor, and it's something that we uh, really have a hard time explaining. It's kind of like how do you describe charisma? <laughs> it, it's just another word for it. And Bruno, however you try to describe it or fail to describe it, he had it. He he just. Uh, he appealed to certainly the the ethnic group of Italians, but the Greeks loved him. The, the fans, fans, all of them, because he was just in real life a very humble individual, and that came across uh, to the fans. And he, if you ever watched any number of his matches, you know he didn't do a lot of fancy things. He didn't, you know, he wasn't a high flyer, but he was a it was a powerful built man and when he was in a match it looked like a, a 
almost a street fight. I mean, and he, he could take a beating, and they knew that uh, he was a powerful man, that he was going to suck it back up and give as good as he took. And I, I remember one old man, and I don't remember if it was in Philadelphia or what city it was in, that, uh, you know, just cornered me, engaged me in conversation. And he said, you know, I kind of looked at wrestling and kind of wiggled his hand. And he said, you know, I, 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 I know what's going on here. He said, but when Bruno's fighting for the title, that's for real. Mm-hmm. And that's how uh, a lot of his fans um, looked at him. They, they, he, he just had the credibility of being a powerful man, and uh, they believed in him. You think that's something that's missing uh, today? Uh, when you mentioned that that the, his matches looked like they were, you know, a street fight. Uh, do you think that's missing at all today? Uh, sometimes a match, in my opinion, anyway, the matches don't really look like a, a competition. It looks more like you could tell, like the guys are are doing working together to do like cool moves. Yeah, I have watched enough ma- uh, modern matches to kind of sh- probably share, you know, your impression that um, without knowing it, you know, from having been in the business for so long, two things I noticed that one thing is the pace is so quick that uh, people don't oftentimes have time to react to simple things. And often time it gives the appearance of being very choreographed. You know, I can look and say, well, one guy got his move, his move in and I could say, well, that must be his signature move. And, and it didn't seem to fit in when it just happened, but obviously he was going to get it in somehow. And then the same thing with his opponent. And it's don't, doesn't seem to be as much of a st- telling of a story as back in the day. And, um, uh, to a degree lacking what was really the essence of our style of wrestling in that era, which was uh, emotion, and to get the fans emotionally involved. Now, don't get me wrong, the modern product, uh, wrestling is healthy. They're doing great, great business. Mm. Uh, I look at the modern guys, and they're, they're a lot bigger, a lot stronger than my era, and they do things in the ring that uh, that I wouldn't even have, uh, dare try back in the day. So uh, it, it's like everything in life. Everything changes. And mm-hmm. change, you know, you could argue maybe change is sometimes not good. I don't know. But the, the, the business is doing extremely well. The WWE has become uh, uh, a, a, a global brand. And yet uh, I look back at the era like when Bruno was champion and then I broke into the business and you know, Bruno, those <coughs> days was defending the title like every three weeks in Madison Square Garden and selling out. And I don't know if the, you know, of course everything changes. There's a lot more competition from other forms of entertainment, but wrestling fans have always been incredibly loyal. And they they loved Bruno Sammartino. They were loyal to him. And when he had a, a strong opponent, that uh, they thought, is this the guy that's going to take Bruno down? They would go out and buy tickets and support him. And, I mean, he had a record of sellouts in Madison Square Garden or probably never be equal. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you still watch wrestling then? Do you, still, do you keep up with it? I watch it sporadically. I don't, I don't follow it. Um, not familiar with all the, with all the names. Uh, and I think another thing, too, that wrestling seemed to back in the day, wrestling was on one day a week for an hour. So you really look forward to the, to it. And then of course, when TBS came on that six Oh five time slot on TBS, people would, would, you know, form their, their schedule on a Saturday to get everything done and be home and sitting in front of that TV at six Oh five when they came on the air. Uh, again, very loyal, Creatures of habit, and in the arenas, like uh, back in the older region, regional territories, like in Amarillo, which was uh, uh, every Thursday night, and I'd come in the ring, and and I might have been there for a, a you know maybe up to a year before I would move on, and it may have been a couple years 
prior to that since I had last had a run through there, and I could look at that front row of ringside, and I, I might not know them by name, but I would definitely recognize them as people that sat in those same seats week in and week out, and if I would come back after being away for a while, I would see uh, faces that were familiar as fathers, you know, bringing their young sons, the next generation. So um, the wrestling was, uh, you know, the people would, it was like they bowled one night a week, they they did this one night a week, but whatever the the night of wrestling was, they were creatures of habit, and they were back in those same seats every week, and they were for me, the glory years of wrestling. Now, when you talk about that, if you notice the same people in the crowd every week, um, what do you do to keep them coming back? Because you obviously can't do like the same little tricks and stuff, because uh, if they see it every week, they would realize, oh, this is a show, and I've already seen this. But uh, so, so is that in your mind? And you know, what do you do to keep it fresh, I guess? Well, there's a couple things. For me and it's always been my philosophy, is less is more. You don't have to go out there. And, and, and I've seen cases where I'm watching a match with a couple of young wrestlers, and uh, there'd be you know, kind of a little bit of a quiet spot, a little bit of low, and somebody in the audience will scream out, boring, and all of a sudden one or both of these guys would jump up like they got hit in the keister with a cattle prodder, and it's like, it's obvious at that point that the audience is uh, controlling the, the the wrestlers in the ring rather than the wrestlers in the ring telling their story and, and, and controlling the emotions of the audience. And the pace of the modern day uh, wrestling is a, a lot faster. The matches are shorter. Granted, the guys are bigger. They, they, they do things in the ring athletically that, uh, you know, I, I never, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed I see some of it, and, and I thought, boy, I'm glad that I was in the business when I was, because I, I don't know that I can do those things or keep up with them, but things change, athletes get bigger and stronger, and they innovate, and they, they, uh, they do new things, and the amazing part of it is, I think, that the, to me, the greatest fan in the world is a wrestling fan, because, you know, unlike baseball, football, basketball, which are all seasonal, uh, wrestling is uh, uh, 52 weeks out of the year, year in and year out. And so that puts a lot of pressure on. And as you said, uh, you know, you can't go out there and uh, be doing the same few moves every week because then the, it would get boring. So it's a, it's, uh, it, it, you, you have to maybe develop somewhat of a style where you do certain things, but uh, you and and different matches on the card also have to uh, give them a different style of wrestling. You know, that's where tag team matches come in, uh, and there are guys that are, uh, you know, that are good at, had good amateur backgrounds and go out there and, and and work holds and and get the same intensity out of the audience as somebody, as somebody that's out there, you know, open it up uh, and being more fixed, uh, physical with throwing punches and elbows and. So that each match is different, yeah. Uh, and and actually, and, yeah. and oddly enough, being on the on the road with the territories, uh, you know, if you're if like I I had a late Dick Murdoch, one of the greatest talents in the history of our business, and I had a feud going with him in the West Texas area, and we'd go in the ring one night, and and you know the match would kind of have a flow to it that <laughs> would would work well, and and we had done it. Uh, it's a similar type of match in, in other in another town or a couple of towns. Then we go to another town the next night, and you know I'm mentally thinking, boy, what what the, the pace and everything and the things we did last night. We had people, you know, coming out of their seats, and you know get started down the same path, and all of a sudden the people are sitting on their seats and sitting on their hands and getting no reaction. Mm-hmm. And that's where it was important to be able to not say I'm going to go out there and rubber stamp the, the, the match. You know, you're going to see what I want you to see. The, the real essence of wrestling was for wrestlers to listen to the people and realize that something that you did last night that got incredible reaction, this is a different audience tonight. And for whatever the reason, 
whatever you did last night, they're not buying into it tonight, and you got to do something different. And that was the challenge of uh, um, you know going out there and being able to listen to the people, being able to adapt what what you were doing in the ring, and eventually uh, get the audience doing something else, uh, but having the same result as you had the night before. Mm-hmm. And then go back to what you're saying about uh, progression of wrestling. Um, since you were around so many different eras, did you ever see some of the like when some of the guys like I don't know like the Midnight Express or something would come in? Um, were there other were there older people who would say these guys are doing too much, and uh, or different guys you know in the '90s and stuff? So I'm just kind of saying like uh, like you say about the natural progression of wrestling. Maybe uh, older eras always kind of had a problem with some of the newer uh, changes in wrestling. Yeah, maybe it was with the passing of time and with age. Some of the old timers thought, you know, they they were critical because they thought I can't keep up with those guys. So, right, that's uh, true. They're they're being critical of it. But a great example you talk about the Midnight Express against the Rock and Roll Express, mm-hmm. and I was around when they they just were doing incredible sellout business. I mean, Jim Cornette was. <laughs> Uh, you know, a part of that story, and and you know, Ricky Morton, he could go out there, and they got him down and got him hurting, and he he, he would just look at those people about, you know, please somebody come help me. He'd almost have the people coming out of their seats, and and wanting to come in the ring to try and help him because, you know, he he looked to be in that bad of trouble, and I. It was years. I don't remember the time frame. It could have been, I would say it was at least 10, 15 years since I had watched the Midnight Express and Rock and Roll Express. And, and this is years back now. And I was a, on a card in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And they were in the main event. And I had been on earlier and went out and watched. And I thought, here are two teams, Cornette, the whole thing that's, the whole scenario is there, and here, here is a chemistry between these two teams and between what they do in the ring and the audience that um, it, 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 it was like tireless. It was, I, I, I am out there having wrestled myself, and I'm out there almost emotionally involved in the match too, sitting in the seat, and I'm on the edge of my seat watching them. And almost like reminding myself, I God, I I I didn't realize how great these guys were. I mean, God, they they've got these people coming unglued. Mm-hmm. So great teams like that can can continue to go on for a long, long time when you have that it factor again, and especially if you have uh, like two teams or two individuals where you have some unique chemistry among them. Mm-hmm. And uh, all that stuff still holds up um, if you watch it today. And and also, uh, I'm always uh, like the the crowd reaction throughout the whole match is there. I think you know when I watch wrestling, I still like wrestling today. I watch it, but uh, they uh, they react when a guy comes out or does like a, a finisher or something. But in those matches uh, in the '80s, especially like in the Crockett era, uh, the crowd just reacting throughout the whole match. Like they're che- cheering the, the the baby, the good guy, the whole time, and booing the bad guy the whole time. Yeah, there's no and, like ball. And, and because of uh, of uh, YouTube, because of uh, um, other things where they can go back, that a lot of these matches uh, are archived. And modern day fans that that didn't see like rock and roll and midnight at, at, in their prime. I mean, I go sometimes uh, on Facebook and, and I'll see somebody that will make a comment about uh, a match that they happen to review and, and comment about how great it was, and then they'll post it. And I'll click on that match and I'll sit there and watch a 15-minute match from 20, 25 years ago, and I, I could sit and enjoy it just as much that many years later because what they were doing was the essence of, of our profession, and, and it was timeless. And a fan, a father could have his son sitting there who doesn't know them from Adam. He may, might even not have been born yet when they were when they were out there, and yet 
that young fan can sit there and what they were doing in the ring is timeless. And what, what is happening is it's building a whole new generation of young fans that weren't there when they saw them the first time around. Mm-hmm. Now, um, when I started watching, I started watching with my grandfather and he, he loved all any baby face. He was a big, he loved dusty road. We watch both. We watch any wrestling we get, but he loved dusty Rhodes. He loved Hulk Hogan. He loved all the big, good guys. And I was like the bad guys, which at the time, not many people did. But I, you know, I was a big fan of Piper and Midnight Express and uh, and, and the, the Horsemen and stuff. So when the Horsemen started to get fans like that, that, that liked them, uh, how did other people react? Did they say, like, this is wrong, you shouldn't have, you know, part of the crowd cheering the bad guys? Yeah, a lot of the fans, I remember we went to Greensboro, which is, uh, was a red-hot town. And when we came out, here was the whole front row uh, wearing uh, a white shirt, a tie, and a, and, a, and a jacket. And they were holding up these flash signs, and they held it up that it said Rock and Roll Express all the way across. And, of course, the fans on the opposite side of the arena you know, we're screaming. And then all of a sudden there was a nod or something. They flipped the signs and said four horse. But, and the fans just, they were ready to charge out of the stands and come down and kill these guys. So uh, it was a chance for them to be interactive. And it's like, I think, you know, with the, with the horsemen, it was a, uh, it was not a creative idea that somebody had and said, oh, we're going to take this guy and this guy and we'll put them together. We're going to call him the horseman. I mean, it was just a, a spontaneous thing of the original horseman with Ole and with Arn and with Tully and with Flair. And I was always Tully's manager. So I was a part of it right from the very beginning. And it, it wasn't like there was, a weak link where the rest of the guys were trying to bring along a guy who wasn't there yet. Everybody was an established, uh, you know, basically main event guy. And then the changes that came, you know, were not wholesale changes, but as like, uh, Ole left and then, uh, Barry came in and, and, you know, for a period of time there, uh, I mean, Luger was not, his experience, he was the one guy, but we were able to camouflage him. And then when Luger went out and Barry came in, uh, God, I thought the group would, that we had with Barry from bell to bell, there, there wasn't anything that we couldn't accomplish. So mm-hmm. it was one of those situations where the horseman thing came together and it was at a TV studio uh, somewhere where Arn did an interview and he always was very creative with his interviews and he he made some kind of a comment about looking at the television camera and he said, everybody out there, you take a good close look at, at, at everybody here has got a championship belt. We got all the gold. We got all the bragging rights and to try and find something to compare to this. He said, you'd have to get into your history books and go back to the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And he held up four fingers and it was a throwaway line that just was a kind of, line that Arn would do with the types of interviews that he did. He was very creative. And, but the, it, from that day on, it was like a, every arena that we went to, four horsemen, and holding up the four fingers because it was like a, uh, it, it became an interactive thing where mm-hmm. they were doing something and we'd give the four fingers an acknowledgement back to them. And it was like three weeks before Jim Crockett said, what's this four horsemen crap like? Mm-hmm. Keep hearing about, and I said, Jimmy, it's not something that was any of our ideas, and it certainly wasn't your idea. You didn't even know what it was, and but the fans are running with it, and it's hot, and you need to pay attention and get behind it. And it became, uh, I mean, it became the highlight of, of uh, all those of us that were involved. It became the highlight of our career. Uh, years later, when you were in WWF, uh, WWF at the time, WWE. Uh, did you, do you see a similarity between that and the rise of Steve Austin? Uh, you know, you could see, you could see similarities, but, and, and it's, 
it's like once something like that is so successful, I, it sounds, uh, you know, trite to say it, but it's like other things come along, they're often imitated, but never duplicated. They'll never be, it's like, you know, Vince never wanted to take something that had been very successful somewhere else and bring it in and give it that same place in the spotlight, that same push. An example would be like the Road Warriors. The Road Warriors were so hot. And so what did Vince do? He created uh, Demolition. And they were his version of the Road Warriors because he didn't want to bring the Road Warriors in and treat them the same way. And that's you know kind of one of the things about the business that makes it so interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, back to when uh, when you were saying that the horseman thing starts to take off, what was uh, Ole's take on that? Since he's uh, you know the more the veteran of, of the group, not actually all of them are veterans, but he was the older you know guy of the group. You know he he Ole is smart. You know he it's all about putting butts in seats, and that's uh, how you draw money. And that's how you make mm-hmm. money. But in all honesty, when you had Flair out there talking about this limousine riding, jet flying, kiss stealing, son of a gun, and know, and and even though I'm a little bit older, yeah, I'm grinning and shaking my head, and Tully's kind of got that cocky look about him, and Orrin got his hand on his hip, and I guess if you really did honest about it, you say, hmm, Ole doesn't look like he fits into that. Right, right, and so for that reason, he kind of eased them, and it, and and it was a natural thing because a lot of times you have a lot of success uh, playing on things out of, out of real life. And Ole's son was a senior in high school; he was an amateur wrestler, and he was doing tournaments. And Ole would want to take nights off and go see his son wrestle. So it was a natural thing for for. Uh, Tully Blanchard, because even when they, like you say, you know, you later on they, they become a baby face, like they are. They hate the, you know, they love to hate you, but but Tully somehow I think was always, always a heel, even when they kind of liked us. They never liked Tully. Uh-huh. So when when Ole was asking, or not asking, but you know, he'd be off, and, and of course Tully'd say, "Where were you?" You know, it's all for one, you know, like the Three Musketeers uh, with the horsemen. We used to stack our hands up. And where were you? Somebody said that you went out to see your brat kid wrestle. And only, you know, Arn made that statement once too often, which he didn't have to say it very often. And Ole just turned around and one slap and down he went. And... That was the what changed it, and, and Ole was out, and that's when Barry came in, or Luger came in, mm-hmm. and because uh, Luger had been in Florida, and I think he had some situation, I think with Bruiser Brody, and a cage match, and <laughs> Bruiser had a short fuse, and maybe got impatient with uh, Luger, who was inexperienced, and and. Uh, and slapped Luger around and to the point that I think Luger climbed out of the cage, went back, got his clothing, and left. And Eddie Graham called Jim Crockett and said, we got this guy who's got one hell of a body. He lacks experience, but if you can put him in the right spot where they can mold him, I, I think he can draw you a lot of money, and that's how we got Luger. Mm-hmm. Now, what are your thoughts on Luger at the time? Um, do you think he gets a, a bad rap sometimes? Or, or what are your thoughts on him? Well, you know, he was what he was. He was, you know, he was inexperienced, and I don't think he ever, uh, uh, you know, ever ever tried to to not uh, admit that that he wasn't uh, as experienced as the rest of us. And he wanted to, we, you know, we all took pride in our interviews, and he wanted to do interviews too, and um, it, it, he really tried. He really tried, and I, you know his interviews, to, in my opinion, were not his long suit. Uh, I think Lex would have been the guy 
you know, they call him the narcissist, which he would have been better if they just brought a full-length mirror out there and put the mirror and him just be uh, just constantly distracted during the interviews <laughs> of of uh, glancing sideways, you know, and flexing and, and looking in the mirror. He'd have got more heat and never opened his mouth. But that's, you know, that's just... Uh-huh. I'm thinking of it now. Maybe I should have thought of it then. But, <laughs> but Lex really did try, and uh, he was a good guy. He was he was a good guy, and I consider him a friend. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, when, when war games like came up, uh, what was everyone's thoughts of the match, and how is that like uh, brought to somebody? Like, does Dusty say this is my idea for a match, and it's two cages and? Like uh, how did how does that come about? Yeah, that was a dusty. Dusty used to come up with these real bizarre things, and, yeah. and he was very, you know, he had a dusty had a great great mind for the business. He was a great talent in the ring, um, and we became very close uh, personal friends over the years, and with his uh, family, with Michelle, and I watched his sons grow up. But Dusty was uh, he loved the business. And the war game, you know, it's like we had the chemistry with all these guys, and it was like, okay, let's come up with some kind of a, you know, we've had lumberjack matches and cage matches, and and he came up with this concept where because he had Dusty, he had Magnum, he had the Road Warriors, and of course it was the Four Horsemen, so it was like, and with, then with me, I'm five, so. He got the thing of us put the two rings together, and and instead of having a cage match, have a a cage around both two both of the rings joined together with a cage around both, and a cage across the top. So it was like, wow. I mean, they always say, well, there's nothing new in wrestling, and I guess that that was new. Yeah. And uh, the you know the thing was it started with two guys. Uh, the, you know, tossing a coin, or, and or, and two guys would be elected, one from each team, and then uh, t- toss a coin to see who was going to get the advantage. And miraculously, all the war games <laughs> we won the, the, the coin uh-huh. toss, like incredible luck. And yeah. so we got to be the first one in for two minutes, which made it two on one. And and then the, they used used to use like the basketball countdown clock and. The fans would count down, and the guys, you know, pulling on the cage door with the referees got it locked, waiting until the time, boom, they hit the horn, and then he'd go, now it's two and two. So it was a match that built in intensity, and the match couldn't end until all ten men were in the ring. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, you know, laid out to be about a 20-minute match. And uh, the first one was in the Omni on the 4th of July, and I was the last one in, <laughs> and uh, there was a, a spot where Animal got under me and had me up in the air on his shoulders, and he's spinning me around, and all of a sudden I look and I see his partner, the late Hulk, uh, bless him, who was trying to, in restricted space, and he was a big man, to get what little room was on the apron up to the top turnbuckle, and then he had to crouch down because the cage was there. It wasn't like the cage was way up in the air. And he started cocking the arm back, and he's yelling to Animal. And Animal turns, and all of a sudden, I see what is not a very uh, attractive situation for me to be in. And I see Animal, as powerful as he is, holding me up. And, and Hawks got the, the arm clothesline and cocked and waiting for animal to work me close enough and i i said up <laughs> if he does take off and hit me the the best thing that could happen would be to catch me with a closed line flip me backwards i come down on both bad knees that's that, that's a worse scenario and so i'm 250 pounds and i'm doing everything even as powerful as animal is to to, to get down off of his shoulders um before he launched and, and, and even animal as powerful as he is, you know, couldn't could totally control my weight. Now I'm coming down on the top of my head and my last second, I tucked my head to keep from breaking my neck and buried my shoulder and broke my shoulder. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so I, I guess 
25 years ago or however many it is, and I have uh, uh, that one shoulder, I have a hump on that side and uh, where it was uh, out of place and uh, it ended the match for me, it was over, and I went, we were in trouble, went, took a private plane back to Atlanta and into the hospital and the surgeon came in, he says, well, we got two choices, he said, we can take you right into surgery and we'd have to put a pin in there or... You can just put it in a sling for six weeks, but doing that, you're going to have a crooked shoulder on that one side, and that's how it's going to heal. I said, I don't want surgery. <laughs> and so to this day, I have that hump on the uh, on the right side, and every morning I get up to shave and brush my teeth, I look in the mirror, and there it is. Yeah. Now, does it, besides but what, the, it, but what it also yeah. did was um, it it showed the fans how truly violent mm -hmm. that match was with all those cages and 10 men in the ring and anything could happen. And I mean, I legitimately got carried out on the stretcher at the end with a very visible injury. Mm -hmm. And I think that set the tone for, I think there was only about 10 more of them all together, but every one of them did incredible business because they knew that they were a legitimately dangerous match. And, and, it was a very good likelihood that somebody was going to get hurt just like I did. Mm -hmm. Besides the uh, the physical appearance of the shoulder, does it does it give you any uh, trouble? Um, some days when it's cold, I feel a little bit in the winter. But other than that, I've, it, I, it doesn't affect my mobility. I love to play baseball. And the one thing that it did do was, you know, when I would play catch or something, uh, like if you were on, if I was on the pitcher's mound and you were the catcher and I would go to throw the ball, I would throw the ball somewhere between first base and the catcher. <laughs> it just, I, I, and I would even try to could try to control it. And I just, it, it somehow threw everything off because I'm right-handed and it's that shoulder. And as much as I tried to adjust I, I just never could, and I can never throw the ball straight anymore. Well, that's too bad. Uh, uh, New England Fan Fest, one of the in Hall of Fame. One of the things I, I like that they do is they also um, give props to like enhancement talent, like uh, Mario Mancini and uh, one of my personal favorites, the Duke of Dorchester, uh, Pete Doherty. Um, Pete Doherty, what, absolutely. Yeah, which I uh, real quick, Pete Doherty. I, uh, he used to because I'm from New England. And uh, he'd be on the Nesson show. And after he retired, he did commentary for a little bit. And I think he's one of the most underrated uh, heel commentators ever. He had a line they still remember, like, you know, I don't know, 30 years later. Yeah, they would show the replay of the heel cheating, and he would go, it's an optical illusion. And I always <laughs> thought that was <laughs> I thought that was so yeah. great, and I still remember it. But, uh, he was very good. And, I, and I, you know, I don't know. There's guys that was around Pittsburgh that, that that were great enough talent that could have gone on the road and and made a a good living mid card top card and I and I think I count Pete in that same way and I don't know if he wanted just to stay around home because being on the road is not as glamorous as uh, a lot of people think it is um, but if you're one of the lucky ones that uh, you do well, and, and I certainly I've got two Hall of Fame rings, and I, I'm I'm blessed to have them. And I just a lot of it, a lot of it is uh, yes, I had the passion, I, I had the uh, the willingness to persevere, and I also had a lot of people help me along the way. But a lot of it's luck too, being the right place at the right time. And I ended up with uh, uh, really a 20-year active career. And there's some guys that. I know loved it as much as I did and dedicated and were willing to work and some people try to help them, but it's just some, there's that factor of the good fortune of being the right place at the right time just comes into place. And, and some guys just never had that good fortune to get that big break in the business. And Pete Doherty might, you know, would be one of those guys. He could have been a main eventer anywhere. So I'm yeah. really looking forward to, uh, to the New England Fan Fest 6, and that's uh, uh, coming up on Saturday, June the 2nd, and it's in East Providence, Rhode Island, at the Brotherhood of the Holy Ghost Grail Hall, and I will be there uh, uh, on that Saturday from 11 to 3, 
signing autographs, you know, shaking hands, greeting the, the good fans from up there. And it's been a while since I've been there, taking photos or, or whatever. And uh, and if there's a line of people, I'm not, I'm not going to get up at three o'clock and walk out. I don't want anybody to walk <laughs> away disappointed. And uh, right. and of course, uh, the 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 Hall of Fame induction dinner, I will be uh, there and be a part of that uh, as well. So it's. Uh, it's going to be a really, really a, a, a great weekend, and um, so this is Fan Fest Six, so it's got a little history to it. Like pretty much, we'll be maybe eventually over time catch up to the Super Bowls. Well, I'm, that's fifty something, but we got a ways to go. <laughs> uh, I know that uh, uh, the Joe Braun has really, really, uh, you know, built this built, built this up. Uh, each year is better than the year before. I I haven't been there every year, but you know we hear re- you know we hear reports. We all talk to each other, and uh, you know I was there. Oh man, it was great. So I was thrilled that uh, that Joe called me back and, and invited me to be there this year. So uh, and I've been back up in that uh, that area for quite a while. So New England Fan Fest six. Mark it on your dates. Uh, the date on your calendars. Uh, Saturday, June the second. And it'd be eleven to three, and autographs, and there's a live event, and there's also uh, that uh, the Hall of Fame dinner, and it's in East Providence, Rhode Island, Brotherhood of the Holy Ghost Charity Hall. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you coming on tonight. Uh, it's it's been great to talk to you. And uh, one last question. This goes back from thirteen years ago when I had you on the last time. Did you ever get a signed copy of, of Luther's book Hooker? I have. I, I have a copy of Hooker, yes. And it was, uh, I had one that I think was personalized to someone else, but it was personalized and best wishes, Luthez. And then I think I I was able to acquire another copy where it was just signed Luthez. So that's one of my most treasured possessions because Luthez uh, for 25 years was the champion and you know, you could argue, you know, like I say, with the loss of Bruno Sammartino, different eras, and, you know, people have different tastes. You look at what Flair's done, and I think it's, you know, it's like you get baseball fans together. Well, who's the greatest player of all time? You know, in the old times, well, hey, well there'd be nobody greater than Babe Ruth. Well, yeah, but you didn't see Mickey Mantle play. And, you know, so it's one of the things that's, uh, uh, great topic of conversation, and who would be the greatest world champion uh, would would be one of those discussions. And I don't think you'd ever find a, a group of people that would 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 all all be in in agreement. But certainly Fez and uh, and Ric Flair and 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 throw Bruno Sammartino in there too. So I'm sure there'd be a, a lot of lively discussions up there. Uh, that's what we're there for. To as greeting fans and, and talk wrestling. So it should be a good time. And I think that uh, tickets can be pre-ordered from, from what Joe had told me. Yeah, and, uh, the website's... Right down. It's yeah, allaccessentertainment.com. Web- <laughs> all, www. And it all runs together. All access, A-X-X-E-S-S, entertainment.com. And if you play with it, I'm sure you can find it with Google. I'm terrible with computers. I have to have my kids do everything. Yeah. But I'm sure you could find it, and uh, it'd be great to, to get advanced tickets because I uh, wouldn't be surprised if this thing uh, is sold out to come day of the event. Definitely. And we'll have the link right on our website. So if you can't uh, spell or you can't find it, just click the there link. There you go. <laughs> so uh, thanks again. I really appreciate you coming on. I enjoyed being on In Your Head. And, uh I, I'm like it's been a few years since I've been up there, and I, Joe uh, Dill Bruin, uh, booked this date with me. It's been, been over a year, and so I've had it uh, in my uh, date counter, and, and I've had other requests, and that's no, I'm going to Providence that day, and I'm I'm really I'm really looking forward to it because uh, the other time that I was up there, uh, it was great, and I'm sure. It's even grown. This is number six, so it's getting bigger and better every year. And excited to get up there where I haven't been for a while and and meeting a, a lot of friends and fans, uh, um, you know, that I that I haven't seen in a while unless they travel. Yeah, very cool. And uh, 
Hope to have you back on sometime before 13 more years go by. All right. <laughs> we'll do that. And I appreciate the time. And, uh, uh, again, I hope, uh, you know, there's enough time that the fans can circle Saturday, June 2nd and, and in East Providence and, and come on out. You know, there's a lot going on. I mean, if you can't do the banquet, you can't do, uh, you know, the fan fest. I mean, there's, there's been so much going on that, that there's things that you could do. And if you could do it all, it will be a weekend. You'll never, you'll, you'll never forget. Definitely. Well, thanks again, JJ. Have a good uh, evening. All right. Yep. Thank I'll you. see you there. Care, all right. As well. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, gang, it's the Total Package, Lex Luger, and you're in your head online.com. Don't miss it.